Hello, my name is Rustam. I am a Google developer expert for cloud and one of uh, Java champions. I work a lot with architecture and developing applications, and I would like to share with you five tips on creating modern cloud native applications. Uh, before we get started, I would like to show a very short and tiny little disclaimer and a sentence that you've probably seen before. There is no cloud, it's just somebody else's computer. Um, the point is to, to, sh to tell you that there is no magic in this thing. It is a computer somewhere out there, but that computer actually has some uh, nice features that will make development of applications for easier for you if you would like to use it. So uh, with that, we should probably jump into the uh, definition of what cloud native applications actually are. So that is a definition from Cloud Native uh, Foundation, uh, CNCF, and uh, it's a lot of text. I know that. And you probably started reading that already. So stop that. I will, uh, I'll do some things for this text. So to disrupt, uh, dis disrupt you from reading that or to help you reading that, that you know, depends. Uh, I highlighted some words here. Uh, I highlighted the words that I think are important to define actually cloud native applications. You probably started reading the whole thing over again. So I will do uh, yet another thing with this text. I will actually remove all not highlighted words. So now we're kind of left with an essence of what is a cloud native application. And one last thing I promise that's gonna be the last thing I'm gonna do uh, a split of what it actually means. So now we have what it is, how you want to do that, and why you really want to do that. So this is this is the essence of the whole definition, right? And when you try to convince someone to do something, like I'm trying to convince you to do now is to use some of those tricks to make your software better, uh, you should probably start with explaining why. Because you know the motivation is probably the most important thing. Because you do things well. Sometimes you do things because it's cool, but it's not really a good way of doing that. You really need to understand why first. At least I believe so. So I'll start with that. Um, why is also uh, similar to business requirements, customer requirements. Uh, you know, you can call it many things, but in reality, it's going to be the same. Your customers, your your you know, who or whoever is asking you to develop the software, it can be yourself. Uh, they all would ask you a similar things. They would like to have as short uh, time to market as possible, so speed, development speed, so features and stuff like that. Uh, they would like uh, you to develop something that is. Uh, Agile in the sense that it can actually adjust to change. So you can change parts of your application without needing to rewrite the other parts or at least do it as little as possible. So those speed and agility, they kind of go hand in hand, but they are a little bit different things. So one is market, time to market. The other one is actually changing stuff inside your uh, application. Third thing would be reliability. So obviously you want to have applications that are reliable, that are there for you when you need them or for your users or for your customers or whoever might be using those, right? Um, fourth thing is very often resilience. Uh, people want resilient applications. People want applications that handle failures uh, that uh, you can observe, you can, uh, feel how they're doing uh, things and, you know, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. So uh, that's the fourth thing. Uh, fifth thing uh, would be to avoid lock-ins because if you develop something that is locked into a platform, a framework and, or, or something else, like absolutely locked into something, it will take a lot of time to rewrite it or to port it to something else uh, whenever that time comes. And that time will probably come at some point in the future. So with a little bit of why, now let's spend a few uh, seconds uh, or minutes uh, talking about what. So definition mentioned scalable applications. Uh, keep hold on to that thought. We'll describe what scalable applications are in just a second. Uh, but scalable applications, and you want them uh, to be 
ready to run on a cloud. That means uh, public or private cloud. Uh, it can be running or you want them to be able to run on another option would be a multi-cloud. So several cloud providers, it can be parts of applications running one cloud and parts on the other, or uh, it's just mirrored to make sure it's totally redundant and you know fail safe and all the other things. It can be different variations of that. And the third option would be going for hybrid cloud where you have parts of your uh, data or applications or whatever that might be on premises and part, partly on the cloud. Uh, the reasons for that can be, again, many. It can be privacy stuff. It can be uh, uh, some kind of legal issues or regulations, or it can be specific hardware, or it can be something else. So with that, now we have a why. So why we want to do that? Well, because customers want us to do all those things that we mentioned, five things. Uh, we know what we're going to build. So we... Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to build scalable applications that are can run on the cloud. Now we should talk about how. But before we go into uh, the part of talking about how, I would like to mention a few things. So one is that the five things that I'm going to mention now can be implemented in any order and in any extent uh, to make your applications better. You don't have to do all them, all five of them, and you don't have to move everything to the cloud immediately or anytime soon. Uh, my claim is that as long as you do things that I mentioned to your applications, it will still make your applications better. It will still make your life a little bit easier as a software developer. So um, let's talk about how. So, one of the first things that you want to do, you know, to increase speed, to increase agility, and all the other things is to introduce loose coupling. Uh, when you sell, talk about loose couplings, things like microservices and uh, uh, APIs and API management come to mind. Uh, so microservices, you've heard before, it's kind of the, the opposition to the old way of doing that when we used to have um, when we used to have uh, monoliths with everything in there that were not agile at all to rewrite parts of it, you would need to do a lot of refactoring and things like that. So microservices is a kind of reaction to that. When you do microservices, you'll probably need to look into APIs and API management because you need to control who can talk to what and, uh, you know, how they can do that and what kind of data can be sent in and out and back and forth and you know all those things. Um, and probably service mesh and things like that also come to mind. But you know, I'm just mentioning that. Uh, but the thing is, you'll need to think about your architecture and you need to think of uh, interfaces, so APIs. Second thing, when we talk about loose coupling and microservices and all the other things, we cannot talk about any of that without uh, thinking of containers. So that's the second part, uh, containerizing your applications and pushing a huge monolith into a tiny little container and just saying, well, we containerize things is not exactly the right way of doing that. So, you know, shoving an elephant into a tiny little box and saying, well, you know, it's now it's in, in a, it's it's in a container, it doesn't really fly like that. So um, you need to re refactor applications. You need to put them in the containers uh, for all those obvious reasons of the cloud and loose coupling and microservices and all these thing, other things. Uh, the thing that is not often mentioned is that containers also uh, give you um, predictability. They give you predictable builds. They give you predictable deployments. And that's a very important thing because you know you don't have this works on my machine kind of thing anymore, which is really nice. A uh, third thing that I would like to mention is automation. So automate all the things, automate as many things as you can, and especially automate the, bo the boring things. So try to automate as much as possible. You will save time on doing all that boring stuff. So that means more time to do fun stuff. Uh, you will have less errors, typically uh, because of some kind of human errors, right? We humans, we do things sometimes wrong. Uh, and that leads to errors, that leads to downtime. You don't want to do that, right? Fourth thing is uh, think about resilience. When you think about resilience, you need to think about um, 
stuff like um, fault tolerance. So you want to have your applications uh, to be as fault tolerant as possible. Uh, that means you need to think about strategies, about you know handling things if something goes wrong somewhere inside your application, outside your application, outside of your control, within your control, all of those possible retry strategies and all the other things. Um, <clears throat> observability is an important thing because you actually can know what is happening with your application and that can be also automate, uh, help to automate scaling, for instance, of your application and stuff like that. So uh, observability is a very nice thing to think about and well, obviously security and everything. And all that will bring you to this stability of your applications and also agility of your applications as well. Um, last thing, the fifth thing is probably the one that is the closest connected to the cloud. It is serverless. Serverless doesn't mean there is there are no servers. It means uh, there is no management or very little management of your application. And well, obviously you will get a lot bang for the buck uh, in the cloud for that because then your applications will typically cost less because you will uh, rent as much hardware as you need and scale up and down depending on the uh, amount of users, amount of pressure, amount of work it has to do in all different kind of uh, factors. But uh, in, 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 in a local environment, your machine, your on-prem hardware, stuff like that, it also means that you will be able to scale up and down uh, using uh, things like Knative or something similar uh, where you, you scale down or up and you free hardware that you're not using and let the other applications use it, for instance. So kind of mini cloud thing. Um, and well, obviously you'll you'll save money in, in the long run on that because you don't have to rent hardware or buy hardware and stuff like that. That would be uh, the time I had to talk to you about uh, cloud native applications. I would like to chat with you more. So let's move the conversation over to the other channels, to social media. Thank you very much and see you. Bye-bye.